Um, we moved fully online now with this um, lecture series for the end of the semester due to COVID, um, but most of you are familiar with the, with the procedure already, so please unmute um, your, um, uh, your, your microphones, please, and pose, write down your questions in the chat, so you can post the questions either in the public chat or to Eva Maurer or Alexander Vorbruck, and we will read them out in, after the talk in the discussion round. Um, yeah, that's it from the technical side. Topic-wise, we're moving from steps to forest this week, and it's our great pleasure to welcome Monika Vasile, who has done extensive research on forests, particularly in Romania and in the Romanian Carpathians, and who has done this in a very interdisciplinary way and um, in the course of a very interdisciplinary career. So both of this makes her presentation a really fantastic fit for this lecture series. Monica has a background in sociology and social, social anthropology. She gained her PhD from the University of Bucharest, um, worked at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Halle, and was a research group leader in sociology at the Romanian um, Academy of Sciences in Bucharest. She was also a fellow at interdisciplinary centers in Germany, um, the Integrative Research Institute for Transformations of Human Environment Systems at the Humboldt, Humboldt University in Berlin. And she was a Carson fellow at the renowned Castle, Rachel Carson Center at the LMU in Munich. And currently she's doing her second PhD in environmental history at Maastricht University. I didn't find any um, geography affiliations in Monica's profile, but she published in some quite important geography journals. So um, she covers this too. She, she also covers the, the geography field. Um, Monica's a more recent current project that deals with human animal um, relationships and in particular the reintroduction of endangered species. But today um, she will present on the political forests in Romania, the timber rush and environmental crisis there. And this is part of um, a, a longstanding project of hers on which she has already published ex extensively and on which she also has a forthcoming book. I'm much looking forward to this talk also because I really think that uh, Monica has done qu some quite pioneering work in around political forests, which is qu quite a um, established concept on the, on the one hand, like, like the political Forest is an understanding from political ecology that looks at forests as produced by um, or co-produced by a number of e ecological, but also um, economic, political, and cultural drivers. Um, but um, Monica is one of the few scholars right now who have applied this to um, Eastern European settings and also the, to the particular historical um, and, and current trajectories there. So, um, Monica, thanks much for joining us tonight, and we are really looking forward to your talk. And the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alexander, for this kind introduction, and thanks to you and to Eva for inviting me, and thanks to everyone for being here. I'm very happy to share with you the research that I have done um, the past 15 years. And I prepared, I hope, an entertaining presentation with lots of pictures. Uh, I will start sharing my screen now. I hope this will work. Okay. So I will start from the present. And what we see in the last years is a lot of 
news that are coming up about the Romanian forests and news especially about the illegal timber trade and the environmental crisis of Romanian forests, about um, violence and murders um, and battles, you know, the, the timber mafia and losing the last virgin forests of Europe, um, about corruption, there is this whole kind of um, apocalyptic kind of narrative surrounding Romanian forests. Um, and of course, this is in a way, this is an, what I say, this is a narrative, so um, it is a discourse and it has something behind and I'm not here to tell you whether this is true or not, but I'm trying to explain in this talk how um, did we get here and what are the elements that explain and compose this kind of picture of, of what is going on. Um, so I'll give you a few more elements about what is um, going on with this narrative in the in the present, and then we will zoom in um, at the grassroots level um, in a few mountain communities, and I will kind of uh, go back in time and explain to you what happened since the fall of socialism in 1989. So part of this narrative of illegal logging and environmental crisis of uh, contemporary Romanian forest um, is the, um, the war on numbers. So the, the magnitude of illegal logging, how much forest is being cut, um, is explained through this kind of very spectacular figures. And for example, the first figure that I put on this slide is three hectares of forest are cut every hour. Um, this is a number that was put forward by Greenpeace in a report in 2012 and has really stayed, this number has stayed up until the present. Then this other figure, 20 million cubic meters um, of wood are cut illegally every year. This appeared in 2018 and it was a figure that derived from the National Forest Inventory and was a lot, it was contested a lot and there were different accusations and assumptions around this figure. And then another brick in the construction of this narrative is the idea that the forest crisis is a moral crisis, is due to corruption of state institutions who are supposed to um, keep everything under, under control. Um, the environmental crisis narrative is a narrative of crime. So it's um, centered around this notion of illegal. So it is a narrative that calls for punishment, for persecution, for criminalization. And the narrative of an environmental crisis actually also portrays to a certain extent the reverse. It portrays the value of these forests that are in danger. And um, Romanian forests are labeled as some of the last virgin forests of Europe. Um, and this, like the Amazon of Europe or the green heart of Europe. So um, there is a construction of value that is also going on in this narrative. Uh, somewhat the flip side of deforestation is the the great quality of these forests that needs to be um, preserved. And then this crisis is also built with these very spectacular images and we see this with the proliferation of um, social media channels. We have all of these very spectacular images and a lot is actually focused on the materiality of the forest and what is going on in the forest. Although as many scholars um, show and also um, a very good friend of mine who also works on, on forests in Romania, Giorgio Ardachescu, he has shown, for example, that a lot is driven by the demand. This illegal logging should be seen also from the demand side and not only from the side of what is going on in the forest with the people on the ground. So what 
what is actually going on and how can we start to think about it? So to begin with, in the current um, landscape of forest practices, we have a few groups of, of actors. Um, we have the conservationists and the journalists who are driving this kind of narrative of crisis. We have the state forestry establishment, um, the state forest service who used to be very, very powerful during socialism and they are kind of defending um, themselves because they are put on the spot as perpetrators and people who allow and who benefit from this illegal logging and they say that if these, these forests are valuable it is because of them and because of their work and so um, their position um, in the middle somehow uh, and then we have another anchor is the government the government is called on uh, to devise policy and to devise sanctions and legislation um, to punish right, the culprit and to stop um, the crisis. So we have a very prominent discourse of criminalization of wrongdoers who are either um, poor people from villages who um, you know, do a little bit of um, forest theft. Um, we have the foresters who are also criminalized we have the, the companies, the logging companies, who operate um, shady businesses on the edge of um, legality. Uh, what is going on is also um, securitization. This is um, what this means is that in 2016, illegal logging was declared a national security threat. And so this adds very much the discourse of crisis. Um, and th this means, in fact, that um, illegal logging can be um, investigated and prosecuted with the help of secret services and state intelligence. And so there's a, there's a very strong emphasis on this kind of, um, again, punishment investigation. Uh, and actually, the, the larger picture is that during this time and through this kind of discourses and processes that are triggered by these discourses, we see a shift from uh, extraction towards conservation. So forests kind of transform from being a resource of timber, they transform into sort of a wilderness frontier, a resource for, for wilderness um, home for uh, endangered species like wolves and bears um, and very valuable old trees. So um, I will I don't want to go. So what I was so I was talking about these discourses of, of illegal logging and that are portraying this this crisis and about the criminalization of wrongdoers. So what these kind of narratives actually do is to polarize um, into polarize different groups and to pit them against each other. So we have a discourse that casts blame and put some people on the spot as wrongdoers and others um, as heroes, as saviors. Um, and as Alexander already said in the introduction, I use a lot this idea of the political forest and that says that forests are not only biological material entities, but they are constructed and they are shaped by political forces um, and the practices that are happening in and around forests to practices of regulation, of extraction, um, as Rebecca Elmhurst says in here, is this provides recognition and legitimacy to some people while excluding and criminalizing others. Um, and what I have done is research with, actually with people who became criminalized in this process 
like the Toku community in the Carpathia Mountains. And I don't know, why did this presentation then go? So I will focus now on the research that I have done in the eastern part of the Carpathian Mountains in Brancia and also in the western part of Romania. This is where I work most intensively in the field um, from 2003. In, in the eastern part I did my PhD and then in the western area I did um, the research. I stayed in a village for nine months. Um, while I was with an office month institute for social anthropology. These are a few pictures. This is when I was a PhD student in Brancia. And so this region in the eastern side of Romania, this is an area where logging is very, very difficult. The soils are um, not very stable and Rancha is an epicenter for earthquakes. The roads break all the time. So many people actually die in these forests um, in the process of logging. Um, my first host in Rancha actually died uh, driving a forestry tractor. Um, and this is an area where uh, in 2000, the communities regained the forests that were previously nationalized by the state, they were um, now being given back to the communities in, in the form of forest commons. So we have villages um, that have a collective title and each villager has an equal right to the forest, meaning they have a right to a certain quota of wood and they have a, a collective, it's a collective right. Um, these are a few images. The forests are, so in the lower areas, we have a lot of beach forest um, that is logged mostly for firewood. And then in the higher areas, we have coniferous forest that is kind of logged more for commercial, for, um, construction timber and this um, one is more valuable for being processed in sawmills. And so what we see in what I saw in this area is that um, so in back in the 1990s what happened? The socialist enterprises, socialist forestry enterprises collapsed. Um, the socialist cooperatives also collapsed in the area um, and everywhere in Romania. And there were a few people that in 1990 were in good positions. They were bosses in these cooperatives or in these enterprises and they were able to benefit because they were, these enterprises were liquidated. So all the machinery, all the assets were sold very cheaply. These people were in the position to buy them for, for nearly nothing. And people also say that they pocketed money from this kind of liquidation. So what happened was that um, with this kind of capital, so with money and machinery, they started forestry enterprises that grew in time. So uh, this kind of uh, period when everything kind of all the regulations and all the institutions nearly collapsed and the forest and the machinery um, was up for grabs. Some people were in a good position to, uh, to benefit from it. And in the 90s, in the beginning of the 90s, everybody more or less um, benefited from this. There was this kind of effervescence going on. Everybody was trying to do something. Um, in the 90s, the forest still belonged to the state, but um, the, actually the fines or the sanctions for cutting timber illegally were at very low level. So this kind of discourse took root in this period that um, state foresters are unable to stop the illegal, the little theft that was going on at the time, that they don't have the, the power or the means of sanction. 
Um, and so at the time, the state was kind of losing its power. The first restitution law happened in 1991, and this gave back uh, 400 hectares, uh, 400,000 hectares of forest only to individual owners. And what I told you about the community forests, these were restituted only like 10 years later when a second law happened and opened up more privatization. Um, and so, but under this first wave of privatization um, towards individuals, the state of foresters already saw that they are losing some of the power. Um, and they saw that things are starting to, uh, to shake up um, and they started to blame these private owners for an ecological disaster that was going on. So the first kind of discourse against illegal logging started like that from the, the state foresters against private owners against the little also the little thieves um, and what is really so really interesting in this area is that these um, mid-sized enterprises um, forestry enterprises started to grow and they became really like they bought more sawmills and more lorries and more trucks. And so they developed this kind of power. These a few patrons, a few uh, company owners really uh, developed their power in time. Uh, and people, so these communities are quite large. There are two very large communities placed exactly at the end of the valley in the mountains. And these are very large communities by a mountain standards. And there is no other source of revenue than the forest for them. And so there is a lot of labor force. Um, for example, uh, where this picture was taken, this is a, a commune, a municipality of 5,000 people, which is quite large for what the area has to offer in terms of jobs. And so these, the, creation of these little factories, little forestry factories, encountered this kind of large pool of labor force. And so people started to work or to, to work for these companies and sometimes like full employees with contracts, but this was actually rather rare. And they mostly worked as illegal laborers or as independent carriers or all sorts of jobs and all sorts of little arrangements. Um, and in the area, there was a lot of talk about the mafia and people described to me what was going on in terms of a, like a pyramid, like a pyramidal network. And this included, so at the top, it was the mayors that were at the same time forestry company owners. And then you had uh, the smaller logger, the smaller logging companies under them who were also little bosses. And then at the bottom of this pyramid, we have the workers that were actually really precarious and vulnerable. And they were, you know, they were always at the whims of the patrons. If, you know, if there is work today or tomorrow, you know, this kind of day, they laboring. Um, part of this network were also the foresters. And for a while, the, the forestry district who was in charge with the management district was part of the state uh, forest service. And so the foresters had to give the permits for this logging to take place. And so they were described to me as part of the mafia. Um, and actually foresters also owned sawmills. So they were defending the forest and also had an interest to cut it. Um, also, these networks went beyond just the locality. They were networks that included county state officials, also upper bureaucrats in the forestry um, institutions, like control institutions. Or um, And people told me, and also the media was full of news, that actually um, upper level politicians are um, connected to these local mafias and they derive income for political campaigns and rents from this kind of work that was going on. So this is the eastern part of, 
of the country. Um, now I will go on to just put it really let me okay so in 2009 and 2010 i went to the western um, part of romania for field work and here this area is very different from the eastern side here we didn't have these companies developing but we have like a household, a little household based forest industry. So we have like every household is doing something with timber. Uh, some have a sawmill and process wood. Some have a horse and go in the forest and bring the wood. Some have both the horses and the sawmills and a larger uh, segment of uh, this village population also has trucks and so they do transport. Um, but what is really interesting, so in 1990, in this area, people always, they, there is a tradition of trading timber, timber planks. And so for 200 years, these people have been um, making timber, making um, wooden planks and taking them with a horse and the cart in the plains of Hungary or in the in the plain um, area of Romania. And so they had this kind of traders tradition kind of going and this even um, kept going during socialism when all kind of um, private initiatives, private commercial initiatives were banned. These people actually kind of continue to do it illegally and this kind of Little arrangements were in place or with the state employees to let them do this, let them do this, let them, the policemen were kind of allowing them to travel on the road without sanctions. And so this, they were in a very good position um, in 1990s with these networks formed during socialism. They basically, this entire area really boomed. And um, some of the people in these villages uh, specialized as dealers in the marketplace. And the village where I did field work was really famous because these dealers coming from here colonized all the markets in the Western area. So they were kind of the youngest generation, people who were 20 years old in 1990, they really kind of felt that this was their moment in history and that they were, you know, ready to risk everything and to make a little capital and to kind of, um, um, yeah, to make, to make a good life for themselves. And so um, there are a lot of stories in the village that in the 90s, it was like in Las Vegas here and there was a big, big movement, a big forest forest rush and there were so there were two there at the very beginning in 1990 there were two sawmills and the whole road was congested uh, with people waiting for the sawmills waiting to do this um, processing and so that's it and what happened here is so in a way, the villages are smaller, and this is really important because and people have a lot of, I don't know, they, they, they have a lot of um, independence, and they state this kind of independence in different ways. And they say, I don't want to have to work for any patron. I don't want to have a master. I'm my own master, and you know, my, um, my fate is in, in my own hands. So they, they use a lot of these metaphors and these, these sayings that show that they are independent. And in a way, this is maybe a reaction to actually a lot of dependence in during um, you know, the last 200 years. Um, in the interwar period, this area was labeled like the poorest area of Romania and people were really at the you know, they were very sick with, uh, they were the highest rates of syphilis and tuberculosis in the country. And so they really, even today, people that I talked with, 
they remember the famine in 1947 and they they have memories of starvation really so in a way in the 1990s is the golden age of this area and this was enabled by this kind of forest rush that also happened at the at the edge of legality but at the time there was not um, so much talk about illegal or legal everything was kind of possible and a lot of profits were possible and so they just rode this this wave um, so now I will these were the two areas that I wanted to to highlight for you like um, at the grassroots level and now I will try to make a few points that sum up these changes that happened um, during the the first two decades after the collapse of, of socialism so on the one hand there was the privatization of the restitution so there were three laws uh, one in 1991 one in 2000 and one in 2005 and um, so with these laws half of the Romanian forests were privatized so some were restituted as individual forests usually kind of in small um, small plots of forest um, and some were restituted as um, commons as village forest and others were restituted to the municipality as communal forests that are not commons. Um, and so these ways of restitution and privatization enabled um, different movements. So on the one hand it was the, the state forestry service felt that they were losing power and they were losing actually a lot of uh, their territory, so to say, um, and private forestry districts uh, emerged in 2006 to manage these private forests, and so this was the this was what shaped up everything. But on it is not the cause, in a way, for what happened because there were many other forces that actually. Um, at the time. So one thing was the, this growth of a local industry um, that I described. Then there was in 2003 a big um, timber processor entered the market, the Holz industry Schweikhofer, and they took a lot of the blame actually in the late 2010s for what happened with illegal logging. They were uncovered by a uh, by an NGO that they were sourcing illegal timber and they were offering bonuses for they were uh, filmed with a candid camera. So um, I also um, want to say a little bit who were the illegal loggers in the 90s as I told you they were the little thieves, the little greedy new owners, little you know, the poor people from villages who were making a, a run for um, for a few a few logs. Um, and then what is really important, and I've described a little bit with the formation of these mafia structures, is the entrance of the political battle. Uh, so in 2000s, we have um, a shift that happens in the illegal logging discourse toward from the little thieves to the bigger um, bosses of the institutions. And what happens in the country is a lot of, uh, so two, two big, two parties that fight each other. And from these forestry institutions, some of the people are also part of these political parties. So what, what is a political opposition becomes uh, reciprocal accusations of corruption and um, illegal logging. And each of these, these bosses try to sack each other in a political battle. Um, and so what happens is also that these big forestry institutions, institutions of control or of management, they become political 
um, like the the heads of these institutions are appointed uh, from the ranks of the political party who is in power. And so um, it changes every time that the, the, the power changes, um, the forces change. And so there is a politicization of, of forestry that takes place in the Kupas and the shift um, with the blame towards the state institutions and um, individuals. Um, and so in like large strokes, this is what um, what has happened in these first two decades. And then what is starting to happen is that with this political accusations, these reciprocal political accusations, um, different labels start to um, to appear like timber barons, mafia, um, fire, forest fire or fiefdom, uh, which describe this kind of discrete regional territories where certain individuals have a lot of power, political and also control over forests. Um, and this is picked up by the media. So in 2010 and 2011, also with the spread of social media and um, journalists pick up the topic and they um, start to broadcast very um, influential um, TV shows that are this kind of investigative journalism. Right. So you have the journalist who goes in an area and swoops onto the loggers and catches the illegal loggers in action and this chainsaw buzz and all of that. And so they start constructing these, um, um, this narrative of illegal logging as a, as a national problem of corruption and mafia. And so, and then around the same time, also, big NGOs uh, become influential. Greenpeace and VZF um, established Romanian branches in 2007. And by the 2010s, they start to be very active and to have a lot of funding and also the, like, the world momentum uh, for um, environmental change is starting to show. And also, Romania becomes part of the EU. And so um, it's kind of um, starting to be under this kind of regulations. Um, I will try, I'm not sure how much time do I have. Maybe it's time to, to wrap up. So what is happening to, um, to the tree cover? What is actually happening to the forest? And there are many narratives here. There are many studies that show that, um, in fact, the logging was not more intense than before 1990. However, there is a lot of disturbance going on in the forest, and there is a lot of disturbance going on in the very valuable forest, in the old growth forest, in the national parks. Um, the forestry community also labels this kind of big numbers and the magnitude of, of this crisis. It labels it as an explosive cliche and they try to put the numbers into perspective and to show that actually there is also a lot of uh, tree cover gain and there's a lot of regeneration um, going on and the forests are actually okay. And what is really interesting about the Romanian forests as in the whole European landscape is that um, they are, so even if during socialism uh, logging was very intensive, they didn't really manage to build, to make these forests accessible, to build the, the access infrastructure, the roads. So currently roads in Romania, forestry roads in, in Romania are kind of three times less than the European um, average. And so, um, and also the, the, the forestry regulations, so what is allowed, what is legal to cut, is at a very low level compared to, um, to the European level. So this kind of forestry in Romania that had a high, high age, 
high legal age of cutting for trees and that was a forestry close to nature as they may call it made this kind of um, valuable and undercapitalized forest in a way. Um, so yeah, there, is, there are these two very antagonic uh, narratives. Some say that actually for Romanian forests are okay, um, and some say that they are in, in great danger and there's an ecological disaster. Um, and there is, yeah, there, this is the ground of contestation. And then, so state forestry still remains very important. However, it lost a lot and is driving this kind of um, contestation of the crisis narrative um, at the moment. Um, and so conservation has entered as a very powerful uh, driving force of what is going on in the Romanian forest in the last um, 10 years. Um, and in this, the role of EU has been, you know, to push for all of these regulations, to, put for, to push for more law enforcement, um, and also to, in a way, to create this image that um, the Carpathian Romanian forests are a green periphery, as my colleague uh, George Iadakescu used it to say, as they are a green periphery of Europe that needs to be uh, to be conserved because these forests are so different from all the other forests in Europe that are, you know, on the plantation level. And what what is happening in this process is that all the people that I have shown you in those pictures that have, um, you know, benefited from this opening of of the forest, um, and that have benefited from this. Um, shady area of this informal economy of forests, they became criminals. So they are the ones who become criminalized in the process because um, in this whole process of pushing for sanction and law enforcement, what is actually happening is that this, the small fish get punished. So um, by going in the forest and, and catching the people who are actually working there, um, so this is the the carriers, the, the people who cut the trees, but the, the upper level of the chain kind of gets, um, remains unpunished. So this kind of process of criminalization and this narrative of illegal logging is actually creating a very large area of vulnerability in these um, communities, in these mountain communities who in fact don't have any other source of livelihood. And what is interesting is that the social dimension is really a blind spot in the uh, official discourses and um, there is not that much talk about how many people are actually involved in this process and how many people will be affected um, and another thing that is happening also on the social dimension is the violence so this this criminalization this fear um, and this uh, pushing for sanctions really creates a lot of antagonism, a lot of conflict. Um, and people, we have um, cases of forest murders. So foresters who have been murdered by the so-called forest thieves who were caught in, in the act. Or we have, uh, I encounter suicides by people who were under charges of illegal logging or people who, um, you know, like set themselves on fire to escape persecution and so on. So there are these very extreme cases that in a way are not created so much because of the illegal logging itself, but because of this whole discourse that is being dealt out. Um, Um, so what is going on at the moment is this increased radicalization of the discourse, increased criminalization, increased securitization, and a way for sound uh, forest policy and for dialogue and for, um, you know, really sitting at the table and thinking what, what should be done is not, I mean, there are attempts towards that, but this is not uh, really happening. 
Um, so I think I'm finished. I completely lost track of time. I hope I'm um, stop sharing the screen. Hello, I'm back. <laughs> right? Can we see you? We see your slide with the two pictures of the of the mountains in 1940s and the 1980s. Okay, thank you very much, Monica, for this really interesting presentation. Now I hope everyone will ask their questions in the chat. We will monitor it here and then ask you the questions. I would, I would like to start with the question and go back a bit in time to 1990. I find it really interesting what you said that even during socialism, these two different areas that you researched, sort of had their diff uh, different ways of using the forest, um, different traditions, and sort of started in, into post-socialism from a, a really different past, right? Even though the regulations were probably the same, or I don't know, maybe were they the same all, all during the 40 years of socialism? But then in 1990, you said the forest became, sort of the forest was divided up in different categories in once, in private forest and also in municipal or communal forest, right? So who decided sort of which forest or which part of the forest became what sort of forest in 1990? Was this a, a political decision who took that? And was it also maybe taking into account what had happened before socialism with that forest? Does, does this past even you know, get into, into that story? This is a great question. Thank you very much. I didn't go that much into this. Um, so what happened in Romania was a restitution. So the, the whole privatization happened following the patterns that were before socialism. So it was a move to reestablish social justice um, in a way for the people who were dispossessed by the communists. So what happened was that they were trying to retrace, um, yeah, these, they, they were trying to find again the documents and people were trying to understand after a, a break of nearly 50 years, what, what did their ancestors have and to bring out the documents and to make their claims for property. Right, and um, so this happened gradually. First in 1991, it was the individual owners, so individual plot of land, and then in 2000, it was the restitution for the whole villages for collectives. And there was a, a lot of chaos around this uh, restitution process, as you can imagine, and people didn't know what belonged to whom, and what do the documents actually say and what is this map and where is this and so on and so forth and that, that's a lot there is a lot of contestation also on the part of state foresters and to say that these privatizations were done in an unjust manner and the state was trying to oppose this kind of privatization on the ground that it is not okay so this was the rationale yeah, thank you very much. We have two more questions in the chat. I'll read the first one. Good evening. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question about the text we read in advance, The Rise and Fall of a Timber Baron, right? The text is written in a way which is not very familiar to me in scientific context, context I think. Especially the first chapter felt more like a newspaper article or even like a short story. 
nonetheless, or maybe even because of this, I felt that the text was a very nice read and that the main argument came across very well. But were, what were your reasons for choosing this writing style? Are there connections to the so-called storytelling approach, which is a growing approach in climate science? The idea there in, in brackets is that hard facts about climate change are difficult to communicate and can be misunderstood quite easily. Therefore, these hard facts are replaced with softer terms and are embedded in a broader story about the big picture of climate change. So story about your, uh, a question about your writing process. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. And I can provide a lot of uh, context for that. I'm very proud of that article. I think it's my best piece of writing. And um, my friend Anna Pils is here, I think, in the audience somewhere. And she really helped me in the process with finding my my voice for that article. Um, shout out to Anna. Um, and so I think I found this kind of narrative voice um, during my stays at the Rachel Carson Center. It, it does have a lot to do with this kind of storytelling um, turn in uh, environmental history. And it, it does have to do with an attempt to really communicate a story that is very juicy and can be told in a very compelling way um, as a story maybe at the expense of other types of communication, but still I really, I really like this, uh, this style of, of writing. And what actually happened at the Rachel Carson Center was that because it was such an interdisciplinary environment and we were together with uh, literary scholars and with anthropologists and you know, all, all sorts of, of scholars, but mainly, mainly the, the literary scholars, eco-criticists, eco and they had a very strong taste, of course, for narrative and for how a story should be told in order to be very compelling. And it's also the, what drove me was also Christoph Mauck, who is the, the director of the, of the Rachel Carson Center. And he also, when he starts telling you something, he thinks, he pauses for a second and he thinks, he says, how should I tell you this story? And so he composes a little plot in his head and only then he starts to. Um, so yeah, I do find this um, quite a good way to proceed. We have three more questions. And before I come to the question from Martin Lucas, which I, I'm, I'm sorry to say I've overlooked before in the chat, I would like to ask uh, the third question, um, which, just is is right latches right on after, to your article as well and, and it's two questions the first is on the beginning of the chapter and everything fell apart it is mentioned that the death of agurida uh, is coincided with the rise of the envir environmentalist discourse as well as the end of the timber boom did the death of of agurida have an influence on the, of those changes on on those changes i think environmental discourse and the end of the timber boom. And secondly, what were the main ecological economical goals of Agurida during his reign as mayor of the municipality? So, yeah, again, thank you very much for reading uh, the piece. Um, Agurida was a small player. He was a small local player. Mm -hmm. And so he, he had a role to play regionally, but not on the whole country level. And what really drove the discourse was this kind of the illegal logging uh, discourse and the end of the boom was really this rise of the, the anti-mafia movement that was driven by conservationists and, and um, journalists. And what I didn't mention in my talk and is actually quite important is also what happened to the market. Um, and what happened to, in 2008, there was the, the world economic crisis that, and the whole construction market crashed. So uh, what happened in this process was that um, the little players, like the people in these villages that worked without contract, and they worked on, on trust, so to say, so they had 
given out timber on credit to different com construction companies that went bankrupt mm -hmm. in the crisis. And so they couldn't recuperate their money. And the, these small timber dealers, they went bankrupt themselves at, at the same time. So the world, um, the world economic crisis acted as a squeeze. And there were many other market factors and that acted as a squeeze that squeezed out the small players who couldn't stay in business and the bigger players actually got bigger. Um, so the other, um, so Agurida didn't, he, um, for, well, for, he was under this, he felt under the weather from these accusations and from these political battles, right? And maybe his health got worse and maybe this had a, an influence on his death. And then his death in this region really brought out all of the, the chaos because he was, this, um, in the, he was this patriarch who was trying to keep the appearance of peace and all the little fish, so to say, and also the upper bureaucrats kind of looked up to him as a man of honor. And um, when he died, there was not this, um, so all the smoke screens disappeared and everybody started to fight everybody and to accuse everybody. And there was a, in the whole, the whole gangrene kind of surfaced. Um, and you asked the other question, what was, what was his role as a mayor, if I understood correctly. So his role as a mayor in the community was basically on an economic level and to bring, so to say, um, to bring funds right, to the community for different infrastructure projects because these communities are really, in a way, they need roads, they need sewage, they need current water, you know. Um, so these kind of infrastructural uh, work needs to be done with funds either from the European Union and that's but the mayor has the role to apply for these funds or he has the role to get them from the government. But this is a lot of political manipulation to get these funds because they are limited. And so you need to be channeled and you need to do a lot of maneuvers to get it for your own community. So that was his role as a, ma as a mayor in a way for the economic development of these communities. And that's what makes these mayors also influential, right? Because they are at the interface between the exterior and the bureaucrats and the politicians and between the local community. Thank you. Now we have two more questions. I would like to go back to the very first one. Um, Marty Lucas, who says, uh, many thanks for your insightful presentation, Monica. What an interesting piece of research. And he sees very interesting comparisons to his work in Indonesia and has two questions. First, you said some state forests were privatized with individual owners, while others were turned into kind of a common village property. Who um, and who, what determined which areas would turn into private properties and which would turn into common village property? We already uh, talked a bit about that. And then do you call all three types of forest, the remaining state forest, the private forests, and the common village property forest, political forests? So would you, would you say that all three of, three of those categories of forests are sort of equally political, maybe? The concept of political forest extends to all forests. So this is, I, I didn't make it. Uh, so it was Nancy Peluso and Peter van der Geest who coined this, this topic. And they coined it actually first in relation to state forests and re in relation to these imperial forests. And to show, they showed how these forests are, um, governed in a certain way and they are shaped and they shape politics so they are shaped by politics and by how the state is trying to build its power and to extend its tentacles into remote territories and at the same time 
controlling these forests and extracting them and creating revenue is also influencing and creating power for the state. So I would, all of these forests are political forests and the, in a way the type of politics is dictated by, by larger state processes, also by global processes and also at the micro level at, by um, local politics are very important. And um, I showed you how in Rancha um, there were these um, mafia structures and in this other area there was also a form of patronage that was actually softer. It was, uh, we had a, uh, in that village there was a very powerful politician who um, was controlling in a certain way the forestry district. But in this area, there are very interesting relationships between clients and patrons and the patrons, so the politicians kind of feel the obligation to reciprocate. They feel the obligation to protect their vulnerable subjects. And so this particular politician of that area created a type of forest politics in the area that protected the locals and it was non-violent. Um, in this other area in Rancha where you had all these little bosses with their uh, enterprises and this developed into a very violent um, environment. So yeah, th there are these different, different types of politics and different ways of um, of understanding this political force as really complex relationships between different actors and processes. Okay, we have another question in the chat, uh, which says, since the forest is a common good, is there another kind of usage of the forest, uh, of the forest by the local population besides logging? And he remembers the picture of the cattle being kept in the woods. Yes, there are other forest uses and in some areas they um, graze the cattle in the forest, although this is legal. Um, mm, they pick a lot of mushrooms and mushrooms um, fetch very high prices. So for some people, this is a very big source of revenue and especially for vulnerable populations like the Roma, Roma populations are known to, to be mushroom pickers. Also, they pick berries and um, blueberries and raspberries that they can sell lower prices than the mushrooms, but still quite some seasonal revenue. Um, these are the main sources of forest revenue. And of course, there's also like a, a little bit now with increased conservation actions, there are a lot of um, initiatives um, like bison rewilding, for example, in different areas. And there's a lot of ecotourism growing as, hmm. but this is a particular type of revenue that sometimes goes to the community, but sometimes goes to external you know, operators to foundations that drive the bison reintroduction or these other entities. Thank you. I have, I have just a, one question, uh, uh, my, my own, which, which came up when you talked about um, it is uh, that it is also very important to see actually the demand side um, of of this whole logging because it doesn't start with one illegal logger just going into the forest, but there has to be a demand um, behind it. And how do you see really the role of big corporations and big players in this field in the last years? Has this changed since Romania became a part of the EU? I mean, the most visible maybe case was the um, accusations against IKEA, IKEA last year uh, of illegal logging in the Carpathians, which was quite, at least here in the press, that was quite a big story. 
but I know there have been many others. So how do they deal with this, you know, with this, uh, the, the big corporations deal with this sort of increasing visibility and criticism towards their practices? It's a difficult to assess exactly how, but for example, um, the corporation that is the largest in Romania, which is Schweikhofer, they lost their FSC uh, certificate um, after these accusations. And so they, um, they kind of um, lost in the process, but also not that much. Um, they still, you know, they remain on the market and one of them, uh, so what happens, I didn't talk a lot about the concept of the frontier, but what this kind of, the theory, so to say, of the frontier, of the extracted frontier around the world tells us that these frontiers move. So once an area closes down or there are restrictions or you know, these kind of bans happen, the frontier moves elsewhere. And what happened was that, for example, Schweikhofer started to source timber in Ukraine. So they moved their operations. Um, and so, and they import a lot of timber right now from other places. Um, and so this is one of the, but yeah, they are pushing, there, there are different, and I don't, there are different um, yeah, moves of the market um, that I, I don't claim to understand them fully, but um, yeah, the, the big corporations tend to stay in business and they tend to find ways to remain at the same level and even to extend their operations. That would be my, my answer. I have a question for you um, too. I was, um, I was fascinated and struck by how you read the story through the through the discursive framing of the forests, also over 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 several several years and decades, and the role um, of the crisis framing. And I found it interesting how how it seemed in, in 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 the story that you told that the crisis framing as such prevailed, but the crisis the actual crises changed. So so you had different kinds of, you, you, you had the crisis framing with, with different objects, with different crises actually. So you had the, 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 the ecological crisis addressed in different ways. You had the um, economic collapse and so on. And then, then the framing bound more to the criminalization side and so on. And I was wondering, um, I think this provided, this provides a, the basis for a really interesting story. And I was wondering, um, in how far you would attribute this to the perspective that you use to, to look at the phenomena and at the discourse and to tell the story, the continuity of, of crisis framings, or if you would, uh, from a historical perspective, um, see more uh, structural historical continuities or, or political dynamics between the different crisis framings which which kind of feed into in, into one another so so how how would you describe this this or or, or frame the, the the continuous framing of of crisis framings it's a very nice question and it requires quite a complex answer. What I'm thinking is that I found the crisis uh, framing quite a lot um, before socialism. So in the interwar, in the, in the first half of the 20th century, this um, crisis 
this course was very present because this was the first, so to say, the first frontier moment of the of the area. After 1850, we have very big um, companies moving in um, and really deforesting. So at the time, deforestation was really happening on very large areas, clear cut. Um, and so at the same time, we have the growth of this, the, the paradigm of scientific forestry and the growth of state forestry. And they developed this crisis discourse of deforestation and look at the, the killing that the, the companies are doing. And then this starts to be after the Romanian um, unification, when the Romanian state kind of um, um, happened when, uh, in 1918, there was this very nationalistic discourse on the part of some politicians that um, we need our forests to stay in place and so on and so forth. So there was a, an ecological crisis described in the Saharan-like deserts or, or moonscapes or, um, you know, quite, quite the same as today in some in some weird ways and this was uh, paired exactly the same with the world economic crisis the great depression of 1929-1930 as well when these companies actually suffered um you know severe blows and so this was also like a market collapse and so th there is that that kind of crisis discourse that happened then and then during socialism there was mm, i wouldn't say that there was a crisis discourse there was a discourse of let's build this together you know centralization planning everything is under control everything is happening at a very steady pace we are all building um you know the uh the right kind of process so this is when this crisis discourse was not an issue like at the level of a national narrative but of course there was the the underground feeling that there is a you know a, a deep there was all of these you know un, unsettling feelings that there's something bad is going on and um but I, I wouldn't say that the crisis, a crisis discourse existed then. And then the discourse immediately in the 1990s was of uh, hope. There was a lot of hope that things are going to be better and there's a transition to a better life and we are all going to be capitalist now. And we can consume everything and, you know, um, and of course, also some people started to see very soon that mm, things are not going well and they are, you know, losing their jobs, losing their livelihoods. So for some people, it started to be bleak already by 1995. Um, but I really think that the crisis discourse started in the late 2000s, mill 2000s, and then it amplifies and with social media um, and with this kind of cyber hysteria, um, the crisis become normalized in a way. Thank you. I, I really like the, the term cyber hysteria. I don't know where maybe it's just the current events. Uh, there's another question in the chat. Um, and it takes us back to the communist era. And the question is, the previously private and communal forests were turned into state forests in the communist era. And the question is, were these lands then managed in a similar way as the agricultural cooperatives throughout Eastern Europe with the former land owners working as forest laborers on those same lands? Or were their lands simply taken by the state and managed and cultivated by others? It was different. So uh, forests were nationalized and people kind of lost connection. Or in a, in a way, 
it, there was not this feeling that this is our plot of forest and we work, um, we work it. Um, what happened in the in the fifties were was that um, mm, how to put it like uh, basins of forests as they they call it different forested areas were opened for logging so they would recruit workers from all over the country to work as state employees but sometimes they would come from 200 kilometers away in these forestry camps forestry brigades of hundreds of people that work you know like they they cut 100 trees a day and so there was this massive cutting in the 50s um what happened then was that so romania was after the war romania was considered a defeated nation by the soviet union because they changed them and uh, romania had to pay war reparations to the in timber so there were these um, um russian romanian or soviet romanian companies uh, of timber and they of, of yeah of logging and they operated for a while and they really kind of cut really massively and with the help of forced labor so they also used um prisoners people that were in jail to to work and they they had to um but and well this kind of um slow down in the end of the of the 50s but then the centralized state economy also recruited people as laborers and they, they and they extended from patches in different areas of logging they in the 80s they extended over the whole country so by then all of the villages were state employees but they were very much what i find today is that um they were very much in the state forestry mindset. They sometimes they talk to me in these very technical terms about trees. And I couldn't understand. At some point I couldn't understand they were talking about forests and about trees. And I said, what is this? And they said, oh, you know, this is this this kind of, of trees that are of a certain quality, of a certain diameter, of a certain, you know. And so this I think this kind of labor, forestry labor, um, consciousness really still uh, persists and it was a very very powerful um, um, people in 1980. Did I answer the question? <laughs> very many thanks come from different people in the chat and also I think from me if there's, do you have another question, Alex? Uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> I'll give it over to Alex for one last question. I would be interested to learn a bit more because you mentioned the commons as as one of the forms that that that, that were attributed to the forest or to forestry after the, um, like in during the 1990s. And and I think the the, the the comments is a very interesting phenomena and, and and idea, right? But it's also it takes very different forms. So I'd I'd be very interested in um, hearing a bit more what what kind of comments and what kind of comment framings you you observed or would um, um, identify in this in these settings. This is a huge topic and I've written quite a lot about it. This was my first like the PhD topic and then my interest in forest was sparked by these different forms of commons across Romania. Um, how do I begin? So starting with the different histories of the different Romanian regions, um, we can understand the commons that are were restituted today in a way as a legacy of many past processes so we have transylvania for example was part of the austro-hungarian empire and there there are i would say there are two main forms of commons there were the free communities so to say 
communities that managed to escape serfdom and they were considered noble or and they had to do with um, uh, border guards so they were granted property rights of the forest by various rulers on behalf of them guarding the border of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and so they had this collective collective forests that were quite large, sometimes more than 2,000 hectares uh, of forest for one community. Um, and then there were the, the forests uh, owned by the aristocracy to which uh, the serfs um, of the landlord had rights. And what happened when these serfs were liberated was that um, initially so they had to fight for this kind of forest rights and the state proceeded to a demarcation of these village forests to grant to these former serfs. And so they, they, there was a huge battle there. And as you can imagine, the aristocrats still hanged on to their properties and the judges that were in charge with making these demarcations, they still, you know, kind of took the side of the aristocrats. And so the, the, the commons of the ex-serfs um, were very small in the end. They, 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 didn't, they were not enough to ensure uh, livelihoods for these people. But um, so, and in each of these, uh, it's interesting because they, from that, how to say, from that moment of demarcation, these communities of owners kind of today define themselves in terms of descendants of those people in the past. So if you had a community of ex serfs they were listed, right? There were a number of, let's say, 30 people. And if other people moved into that village, in most of the cases, they didn't get rights to the common because it was only those ex serfs who had the rights, right? So, and this kind of system gets perpetuated and this is what was recreated today. And in many cases, you have a group of descendants who hold these rights and they also, because they inherit the rights. So because this, this notion of commons got in a way twisted by this kind of civil property understanding this kind of rights get transmitted, get inherited. And so if I have a right and I have three children, I divide the, my right in three portions to my three children. If I have only one, I divide it only into one. So they, the, the rights become unequal. And also at some point in time, it is allowed to sell the rights in, in the community. So, so, you know, because it's this, you know, the notion of the common gets mixed with the idea of property that you can buy, sell, inherit, and so on. Um, and so what we find in the region of Ganja, actually, the, the eastern area that I showed you, is this is a very peculiar form in, for Romania where you have the territorial right of the village and everybody has equal rights. And this is because at the time when these rights were registered and they were formalized in the beginning of the 20th century, people there kind of resisted these uh, formalization on the personal title. And they said, what is this? We don't understand this system that comes from somewhere else. We want our system like, you know, when a person dies, the right dies with them. And we want the young people who, everybody who, um, you know, uh, becomes a major at 18 years old, we want them to have the right to the forest, right? Not only after his parents die, they inherit these rights. We want all the community, the able-bodied people to have these rights and have the right to participate and so on. And so that, that's why in this, this area, this kind of system stayed. So yeah, there are different. So in Transylvania, we have these two systems that are inherited somehow from the imperial 
from the empire legacies. And then in the other area, there are very complex processes that kind of come to form uh, different forms of commons today for each area. And it's very complex for people who do forest policies. They don't really have the knowledge because it's so complex. Okay. Thanks so much, Monica. This was um, really interesting, really great, and and really um, rare insights for many, I think, and, and much much to learn. Um, so thanks for being with us tonight, in even <laughs> on online. Uh, we appreciate this a lot. Um, Thanks to you. There's no clapping in, in, uh, in as, as in the live format, but we had uh, much appreciation in the chat already. So um, thanks from all of us. We will continue the series in um, two weeks with a talk by Mariana Pavereskaya on um, climate. We will stay with discourses and turn to climate and to Russia again. And, and this will be on climate discourses in the Russian Federation. So um, thanks for being with us and see you in two weeks. Thanks everyone very much. <laughs>